join us later. So hello everyone. And the first thing I want to say is thank you for joining us today because we know that people in Ukraine now have power outages and like maybe some of you do as well. And we really appreciate this and we really appreciate you coming. And we would really appreciate if you can turn on your cameras so we can see your faces. It doesn't matter what, what you're doing right now. So if you're eating and doing sports and listening in the background, that would be cool. And we really want to see you. The second thing is uh, please uh, during the session, use reactions. So you can do like this or like this. Reactions are at the bottom. You can find them and just send them so we can know that you're alive, you're still with us. And another one, if you wanna say something during the session, just please don't be shy and raise your hands. Uh, the raise hand button is exactly where reactions are. Uh, at the bottom, there are like reactions and you do this. So we can see you're in the line and we can let you speak out. So if you're ready, please send any reaction. Okay. Fine. Yep. So I just spotlighted them and let me say like a few words. So first of all, this is the last session in this volume of Coaches for Ukraine. And today with us, we have uh, Dan Heis. He's a partner at Atomico and he's been a partner there for like past 10 years. And also he's responsible for leading and involving the growth acceleration team. And I guess I can pass the mic to Dan and sure. he will introduce himself better. So let's go. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for taking time out to uh, spend some time with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm a partner with Atomico. Uh, we're a VC firm based out of London, predominantly investing in Europe. Uh, we do both early and growth stage. Um, been with the firm for 10 years, as mentioned earlier. And today I head up a post investment platform, what we call growth acceleration. Um, I'll walk you through a little bit of what that looks like. I won't pitch to you too much. Appreciate it. that's not what we're here for. Uh, and then um, before Atomico, I was head of talent over at Skype uh, for three years. So helped take the company from 300 to 3000 in three years. Uh, Skype was acquired by Microsoft for 8.5 billion. Um, before Skype, I was head of talent for Google in Europe. So I joined, we were about 100 people in London. And I kind of built and led the team that took us from 100 to about 10,000 in five years. And before that, I was uh, doing a similar job at a company called Cisco Systems when Cisco was very new. And before that, I was in the British Army for about six years, where I was a, a tank commander at the end. Um, and then today, I'd like to talk to you a bit about kind of how do you build high performing teams? Uh, so this is very practical. Um, this is from our, our kind of people 101 boot camps. Um, so it's a practical guide. There's so some, some of the tools you can use, some of the techniques you can use. But it, to me, it's about how do you create um, a version of what we call customer lifetime value, but we call it employee lifetime value. And I'd love to say I came up with the concept, but it's something I stole from uh, one of the companies over at Stripe. But it really is kind of what are the key levers you can use to ensure that your people who join you on your journey um, deliver outsized returns during the time together. So I've got some slides. Uh, I won't spend too much on the Atomico side or the GA side. I'll jump into the content, but um, let me just share my screen and we can go from there. And then tell me if this is working or not. Hello there. Okay, let me put that over here. Let me just move this back over here. And just minimize that. So can you all see the, the slides? I know people are on mute and whatnot, but um, if uh, Ivan, if you could give me a wave that you can see the slides. Cool, good man. I'm just looking at the names. Ali, you can see the slides, you're all good. We'll take that as a yes. Okay, cool. Um, I do speak really quickly, so I will try my best to slow down. Uh, I appreciate you're all much smarter and more intelligent people than I am. So if I'm going too fast, just give me a wave and I can slow down a little bit. Uh, we can go from there. <clears throat> okay, so agenda wise, um, I'll do a quick intro to Atomico. Uh, I've gone, gone through kind of about me, but I'll, I'll skip that very quickly. I'll talk a bit about talent. So at Atomico, we have uh, five sets of excellences, people, commercial, uh, corporate development, communications, and then what we call legal ESG. I, I also lead up the talent function. I can talk a bit about that. 
uh, and then Q&A. Um, but the best way to make this session hopefully valuable for you all is just to interrupt me, ask questions. If you agree, great. If you disagree, let's have a conversation about it. Um, but again, the, the idea is the more, more interaction we have, the better the, the session will go. So Tomoko, again, VC based at London, very quickly, we've been around for 15 years. We've got about 7 billion under management. Uh, there's 80 Atomicans, about 20, 25 in the investment side, 15 on the growth acceleration. Uh, and then we have a bunch of enabling functions that help us uh, get access to the best companies. And then once we have access to help them fulfill their, their mission to become category changing uh, organizations. I've uh, got about $23 billion companies um, and we've got a portfolio that, that numbers over the, over the hundreds. Um, and we've got a, a very strong track record of supporting European breakout companies from Ivan to Messageburg, Graphcore, uh, Pipe Drive, True Caller. So as I said before, predominantly we invest in Europe, both in early and in venture. Background I mentioned before, so I won't go through this too off too much, but uh, again, you, you we kind of cover this part here. And then our GA platform, as I mentioned, people and talent is where we can support founders, corporate development, so access to strategic capital, communications. And what we mean by communications is um, storytelling. So how do you as founders or founding teams tell compelling stories to potential employees, potential customers, potential investors, build a position of thought leadership? We, we really double down on that. And then commercial, um, again, I'll walk you through the team, but we can do a number of things from helping you build out your sales motion, be that PLG or enterprise down. Uh, forecasting pipeline tools. We have a business development team that enable access to uh, technology buyers across the Fortune 1000, across the FANGs, across the portfolio. And then legal and ESG were big fans and big supporters of building diverse and inclusive organizations. That for us is one of our, our big missions. And we have a team of folks that, that can help on there as well. Uh, we are very strong on community. So we love to help founders enable other founders, functional experts, other functional experts, we have an expert network where we have 50 of Europe's breakout functional leaders who are exclusive to Tomico, and then we help them uh, work very closely with their, at the portfolio. And the Tomico Investor Programme, 35 of Europe's breakout founders are investors in our fund, um, and they can get involved in either co-investment opportunities with, with companies, they can do um, advising, board roles, whatever, whatever you need. This is the team. Again, I'll, I'll go through this quickly, so nothing, this is the reason we're here, but we have people who have built companies like Snowflake, TransferWise, Google, Skype, Farfetch. Um, what we focus on with this team is recency and relevancy of building category winners. So it's really important that they, they come here fully formed. Um, it's not a training round. And then it's really important that they've done something of significance uh, recently with relevant breakout companies. And on the talent side, which is quite getting relevant to today's conversation, um, this is how we think about our people stack. So you've got your tech stack and you've got your go-to-market stack. For us, the people stack is the areas you can hear. So we will work very closely on helping companies build an organizational um, planning and design. So how do you right-size your organization? How do you design an organization that will take you from C to A, from A to B, B to C, and then into IPO and beyond? So we spend a lot of time working around there. Culture and DNI again, very important to us. Um, you'll see some data later on, which is why do people join certain companies? What does it attract some for us? It's around culture and leadership, and I'll, I'll walk through that. The executive team build out. So Europe now has a, a good two decades of experienced people that have been part of scaling tier one organizations. So it's either people that have built that those teams before or people that work with them. But we work. We have an ongoing pool of people that we can. Uh, recruit four portfolio companies, deploy two portfolio companies for founders to uh, do best uh, benchmarking. What does great look like? So we work very closely on that. And then uh, I think a couple of unique areas. So leadership and manager development, we're, we're big fans on that. So we'll work very closely in terms of how do you as founders develop your leadership skills? How do you as uh, leaders develop your managers, first time managers, manage remotely? We spend a lot of time working on that. Compensation planning, um, we pretty actually got a lot of robust data in terms of what it takes to hire people, retain people, equity grants, salaries, bonus schemes, we, we got that. Peers and mentors and advisors, again, I, I mentioned that earlier. Um, and then something we have a very strong track record is helping European companies expand either to the US or into Asia. So we have folks that are part of our team that are in New York, Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing, uh, Sao Paulo, and again, they, they will work closely with companies. And then employee productivity, so OKRs, uh, onboarding, sales planning, um, HR technology, and then our network of people, people. So as we onboard new portfolio companies, identifying 
mentors inside the portfolio to help the next generation coming along is a, is a, is a key differentiator for us. Am I speaking too quickly or just want to do a quick sense check? Is it pace okay? I'll go back to Ivan because you, you're the only person I can see, Ivan. But you, you're good? Okay, thank you. All right, so before we start, the key thing here is, you know, there's no secret code here. It really is just kind of focus, work, and accountability. But we like to think of it as maths and magic. So for our software engineering friends, the maths is the important part. And then for our, our founders who are more creative, the magic. But bringing together maths and magic, you can build really amazing, powerful category winning companies. And then high-performing teams. So uh, the concept of employee lifetime value. I take you all familiar with customer lifetime value. So what we try to do is find a metric which is comparable to what is already being used in the industry. And the way we come up with it is employee lifetime value. So what is the net contribution that can be derived from this relationship during the duration of the time you're together? So that can be four years is pretty normal, two years, 10 years, but it's the contribution the employee adds to the organization minus the amount of time it takes to recruit them, onboard them, train them, deploy them, is what we're calling uh, employee lifetime value. And then what we've seen across our portfolio is on average, more than 60% of the capital that you raise is spent on people. So we wanna make sure that you get the best return on investment. Again, historically, not, not so much these days, but historically people or the people function has been an afterthought. This really is kind of looking at people as being a, street, a key strategic tool and how can you deploy them? How can you, um, for the one of a better word, use them? But at the same time, what can they get from uh, developing themselves during the relationship that you're together versus what can you take from them as employees, either through sales or software engineering or product or whatever that looks like. So let's look at some practical tools and some tricks on how you can build greater ELTV than your competition by focusing on a, a key a few areas. Any questions so far? I'll pause from time to time just to make sure, just quick check in, but. Any questions so far? Looking good, okay. Sorry, Ivan, you're the only person I can see. <laughs> so I'll keep going back to you. All right, so here's, here's three scenarios and I'll use my mouse to kind of give you some, some examples, which is on the left here, you see what an average employee lifetime value looks like for a average company. So the company's not great at recruiting, it's okay at onboarding, it's got good leadership, it's got good management, it's got an okay culture. So this is the, this is the contribution element. What we've done here is if you if you practice just by 25%, the contribution that that person will bring is significantly higher. And what I mean by this is, so what you can see here is the blue is the time it takes to recruit people. They're sucking hours from the organization. You're interviewing, you're assessing, you're making offers. They're declining your offers. You're going back to zero again. Um, but what's the amount of effort it takes to recruit um, star players or A players, we wouldn't call it, into your organization? Then what you have is the onboarding piece. So how can you get your new team member to maximum productivity as fast as possible? And what I don't mean by that is kind of swag and like, you know, um, office tours. This really is immersing them into the organization, giving them as much data as possible so they can hit the ground running and either sell faster, build product faster, recruit better, whatever that, that, that key contribution can be. So how can you get them to maximum productivity as fast as possible? And then what you see here is around management, and then leadership. As a manager, how can I get more from the employee? And this isn't about kind of working crazy hours or weekends, although that sometimes is important and is sometimes needed. This really is about inspiring and leading and motivating. So how can you get them to, do, to achieve even more? And if you have a strong, compelling culture, they will stay longer. And this really is all kind of the, I don't know if the expression translate, but this is all the gravy you get by just being better at those four things. And then sadly on the right, these are the companies that are just awful at recruiting, they don't onboard very well. The person doesn't stay. Then they leave and you've got to start again. But you can see just by practicing four or five key areas, the value add is significantly higher. I think I've just gone through this. So what, what creates a higher employee lifetime value? So the culture, the vision and the mission. Why do you exist as a company? And what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Hiring being best in class against your competition. Uh, I, when I was at Google, when I was at Skype, we could easily hire 100 engineers in a week in London, no problem at all. The backup plan for the best engineers is they go and spend time at a FANG. They move to whatever city, they make hundreds of thousand dollars a year on salary, hundred thousand dollars on stock. So why should, I why should I pick your company over anybody else's? What is the compelling thing that you're solving? What is the mission that you're leading? 
onboarding. I mentioned that about getting to maximum productivity. The what we see over what we see in the companies I've worked at is the the, the percentage of people that accept an offer that don't turn up is minimal. Um, so if you embrace that and create internets and portals and give them the content, the tools, pitch decks, board decks, product roadmaps, sales material, immerse them into your company before they join. And the best part is they will be getting up to speed on someone else's salary. So whilst they're sat in company X on their notice period, if you've hired people who are curious and motivated, they'll be off learning about your product, your company, your mission, your your um, your vertical. So get them to do it on someone else's money. So when they come to you, they're, they're ready to go. Mentioned leaders and managers, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of what we might mean by that, but uh, having highly, ex highly motivated, inspirational leaders who can raise the bar, push the ambition level, and having managers who can help support the execution against those goals is really important. If you leave it to them to create their own management frameworks, you're going to bring a hosh posh of this work to X company, this work to Y company. What we've done through uh, programs we've created here is demystify what makes a great manager based on data. We ran a survey of over 35,000 engineers. Um, we looked at the output of the high performing managers in certain companies, and we came up with kind of five or six core areas. So if you can go in there being thoughtful by design, you can create these frameworks. Very light people frameworks. Um, as you get to, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 people, you're probably going to start hiring a, a head of people, a head of HR. Um, getting that timing is right because those these people will come and bring programs to your company. And because they're really good and ambitious, they will want to launch programs. The way I think about it is sometimes these programs can create friction in the organization. So don't hire them too early. Don't hire them too late. Uh, if you've got good board, uh, sorry, good investors, uh, the majority of VCs that will have people like us who can come and spend time with you, who can do it from first, first principles approach. But what are these kind of light people frameworks you want to have so people can achieve more? Back over here. And then uh, recruiters. So uh, one thing I picked up from the Valley uh, a while back is the best recruiters can make a world of difference in terms of getting you the, the best people into your organization. Again, historically, recruiters have been seen as a secondary function. If you go to the US now, employee seven or eight uh, is typically a very, very strong recruiter. Um, and then he or she will basically run that function for you and make sure you get great people. But the hiring a really strong recruiter is a, is, a, is a difference between night and day. All right. Any questions? Vladimir, I'm digging your headphones. They look pretty cool. Thanks. <laughs> any questions all good pace okay okay cool. just a reminder that if someone wants to speak up just raise your hands and you can speak up yeah let me see if i can just do something here move this back a little bit let's try and move this over here it doesn't seem to want to move okay so we, we mentioned why people join certain organizations over other we again we look at the data the data tells us that you look for companies with very strong cultures that are mission-led they're solving something really important um, so I think gone are the days where you'd have European copycats of US companies. Now they certainly are leading the way in terms of creating categories, solving incredibly big problems or um, societal challenges. So culture is, is super important. But what makes a good culture? And there's lots of different definitions out there. Um, but what we believe from founders like Daniel Ek or VCs like Ben Horowitz is um, culture is what binds us together as a group, helps us make decisions that are for the, better, the greater good, and it's a shared set of values and principles. And then Ben over at Andreessen Horowitz is saying something very similar. It's a way of life, a group of people, it's behaviors, it's beliefs, it's values. Um, and importantly, it's kind of how do you recruit people to your organization? And then how do you um, celebrate them for the work they're doing? So your people will see how people get promoted, how they're treated internally uh, based on the behaviors they role model. And these will become your, your culture. So you can, again, leave your culture to build itself or you can define the culture you want from the, the very beginning. And our definition of this is, uh, it's everyday assumptions and beliefs and the values of each team member that go in pursuit of the company's big, hairy, audacious goal and define our mission, which is our real culture. So how do we make decisions when the CEO is not in the room? How do we make difficult decisions? What's the input into that? How do we treat people when no one else is looking? Um, I think is, is, is an important part of this. And why is it important? So again, we look at the data. 
Um, the number one reason people will join um, a, a, a startup, if you will, or a company, is culture and values. And then second is senior uh, leadership, which goes into leadership and management. But this is the number one reason people will join your organization. Now, it's not the same everywhere. I appreciate there's different things going on in different countries. Um, but when we look at the data at a, at a high level, these are the reasons they leave. And importantly, these are the reasons they, they I'm sorry, the reasons they join. And importantly, in reverse, these are the reasons they leave. The culture's changed. It's not the same when I joined two years ago, three years ago. Leaders who are in, um, I guess, influential roles, who are not role modeling the behaviors that the values are saying, and then career development opportunities. So in startups, a little bit different. There's lots to be done. As you as your company gets to 100, 150, 200, people will start to want to see what's the career development opportunity, what's the framework, how do I get promoted? Um, the conversations will change somewhat. Best mention there. Okay. So where to start? So we kind of go back to what I just said there, which is, you know, what's your vision and your mission? Why do you exist as a company? What are you solving for? Uh, we get, first, we're big fans of inclusivity, diversity, inclusion. Um, so being inclusive from the, from the beginning. It's much easier to build a balanced organization when you're five people or 10 people than when you're 100 people. By then, it's probably too late. So if you can be purposeful from the beginning in terms of diverse, inclusive teams, um, you'll find that that will attract other people to your organization. Again, get to 100 and it's probably too late. Get to 500 and you're done, basically. Um, we like to think of it like a, a brand book. So taking time out with either your co-founder or your leadership team, or if you're a single founder, a bit like your brand book. So being thoughtful about the brand, the way you want your company to be seen, your product to be seen. We think of building uh, common language values and standards and being very explicit in terms of this is the type of company I'm looking to build. These are the behaviors that you know, we're looking for you to demonstrate. These are the behaviors that will get rewarded. And then these are the behaviors that we will not tolerate. And having zero tolerance around anti-culture behavior is really important. Again, people will look at leaders and see how, how they behave and then role model based on what they think will be successful in your company. So set the framework, set out your principles. We spend a lot of time on our own principles here and I can walk you through some of those. And by being explicit, um, hire, promote, recognize and fire based on them, no exceptions. If um, I don't know that the Uber thing still works about brilliant jerks, um, but the least amount of those folks you have in your company, the better. And then a lot of people talk about hiring for culture fit, which I don't think is the right way of thinking about it. I think it's more about culture ed additive in terms of how can this help your company become better, stronger? as opposed to they fit the culture of where we are today, high for the, for the future. And then I would say lead by example. I'm just gonna try and bring this down a little bit. So it's really important that you as leaders set the tone for the organization. Any questions? No, Sergey, I can see you now as I scroll across the cameras, all good? No questions at all? Go on, Sergey. Yeah, I can tell you've got one. <laughs> Basically, you you you're saying uh, the 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 basis. Uh, it's all makes sense. Uh, so nothing to that. No problem. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'll keep going. Then we can stop. Um, and hiring. Um, so hiring is a bit of a myth in terms of how you go out there and attract and recruit people to your companies. Um, there's a lot of pos false positives. And what I mean by that is the wrong signal. So we see it all the time where uh, a leader from a company like Facebook or Google or I don't know Uber or something turns up. And because of the CV, they expect the person to be brilliant. Nine times out of 10, that person is not brilliant. They just happen to join a company at the right time. So as I like to say, I, I joined Google when we were about 100 people in London. I left, we were 10,000. A monkey could do what I was doing. It really was one of those companies where it just had so much flow of candidates to that company. It was about building the process. So don't be attracted to the, the logo. Dig deep into when did they join that company? What did they do? How did they do it? Again, we can help you with questions in terms of kind of diving deep. But forget the logo. Go into the time they joined that company. Let's go to this. And I think of hiring as being like a, a mixture of... Lots of different functions. So marketing communication. So how do you build your employee value proposition, which again goes back to the culture and mission. Sales. So looking at the funnel, where are people coming from? The waterfall, the conversion, where do your best candidates come from? Uh, as you get larger and larger, forecasting is really important, especially if you have like a limited um, runway or burn rate, burn rate. Closure rates, look at the feedback, A-B tests on things. 
a deal desk in terms of interviewing and assessing. So hiring someone because they're a good person or they got a great CV, you know, not, <coughs> excuse me, not relevant. Um, going super deep on reference checking. I'm a massive fan of making sure, of asking founders to do between five and 10 references themselves. Do not leave it to your HR function or your recruiting agency. There's a couple of reasons we say that. One is you can ask the follow on questions that will come up as you take the references. Two, you can build out your network. So you can use that as an advantage to reach people that could be potential employees down the road or potential partners. Um, and then I would look at it in terms of when you're interviewing people, taking very detailed notes of the people they say they work with and did the job. And at the end of the process, someone will say, let me give you their reference. Let me give you my references. I would suggest you go back and say, actually, I want to speak to him or her that you mentioned during the process, because that's that's the type of that's the type of reference you, you want to get. And then when I think about customer success, I think about empl employee onboarding as I do about customer success. So how do you get your employee up to speed as quickly as possible, which I mentioned before, is very, very similar to how do you deploy your product into probably a larger scale organization, but how do you handhold that um, employee or customer to get the best from your product or from your company? Uh, analytics reporting, so we measure everything, um, bottlenecks, partners, sources, just really, look, just really digging into data. Uh, again, I'm guessing most of you are really comfortable with data, but you'll find some trends in there. You'll find some bottlenecks. You'll find some things that aren't working, um, but it'll help you figure out kind of where, where to spend, where's the best ROI, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and then delighting candidates with wow experience. You know, again, sounds a little bit cheesy, very simple to do, but we're all human. Um, so when you, when you, when they, when they, when they interview with you and they don't get an offer, they walk away saying, well, I didn't quite get an, I didn't get an offer from this company, but everybody I met was super smart. Everybody I met was uh, very well prepared. Everyone treated me with respect. And I would recommend that to a friend for a, a positive experience. It's the ones where you ghost them or you uh, don't read the CV or you're poorly prepared is the thing that people people always remember. Again, back to, back to maths and magic. So a few recommendations we use. I'll just do this quickly and I'll, I'll walk through them all. So scorecards in terms of um, being thoughtful around the types of questions you want to ask. Structured interviews. And I've got an example of what we did over at Skype a while back, but... If you have a four-person interview panel, making sure, for example, that Sergey will focus on culture fit and Ivan will go deep on tech chops and uh, Sasha will focus on internal stakeholder management, whatever's relevant, but being consistent in terms of the areas you probe for, because you'll, you'll start to become an expert very quickly in those particular functions, and you can go much, much deeper into the, um, into the interview questions. Batch day, if that's relevant, um, bar raises. So these are people in your organization that uh, are responsible for making sure that the new, the new people coming in raise the bar of the company. They're independent. They have no skin in the game about filling that particular job. It could be founder, co-founder. If I think of companies like um, like Supercell, which you may or may not know is a gaming company at Helsinki, uh, probably worth, I don't know, probably 10 billion, 15 billion. Uh, up until about employee 250, Ilka, the CEO, would interview every final candidate. It's a huge commitment and takes a huge amount of time. Um, but he would be the ultimate bar raiser for his company. Uh, hiring committees, pros and cons on both of those. Um, but again, I mentioned I'm referencing, which is uh, it's a key weapon in your arsenal and making sure that the person that you're speaking to has done everything they said they would do. And then I said before, referring to your notes um, for references as opposed to Dan would like you to speak to four people who probably uh, are good friends. I go for a beer with, I gave a good reference on them last time around. Um, so they're not really valuable at all. And then the five to 10 hours or one hour in this case, you, you, only, 10, you only 10 minutes on the call with a, with a reference, which is like, say, say you spend one hour or two hours doing reference checking. Um, it will save you weeks of headache when that person does not work out. All the conversations you have to have leaving the organization, the internal drama that they create in terms of this isn't a great place. I'm thinking about moving on. Um, investing up front will save you a lot of headache on the, on the back end. Uh, and then uh, I learned this myself if, uh, a while back, which is I would follow up with an email. So we make an offer and the person accepts, accepts, the, accepts the offer. And then I would send them a very detailed email with, this is what I expect from you. These are the resources you're going to get. This is what we expect to achieve in month one, three, six, nine. 
So when they turn up, there's no misconception about the role that they've been hired to do. There's a few things we've done in the past, especially around senior folks, is we'd ask them to do a case study based on the role we're looking to hire them into. Then they would present the case study back to us. That would then become their business plan. So we talk about what are you going to achieve, the resources you need, how long it's going to take, what does success look like? Um, and because they came up with the plan, there's, you, there's nowhere to go back on in terms of, I, I didn't understand I had to do this. This is all new news to me. So we use that as being a way of, one, uh, digging into, can they do the role that we're looking to hire them for? Can they come up with a comprehensive business plan in terms of resources and how long it's going to take? And then that becomes the business plan once you're in the organization. Um, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about onboarding on someone else's money. If these people are working at these larger companies, they've got three month notice period, bringing them into your company as much as possible, immersing them in the data, um, sharing what you can share, bring them to all hands or Zoom calls or whatever to make them feel part of your, your company. And again, going back to the recruiter, um, getting the best recruiter you can find, but making sure they have the right tools to do the job. I think that's it. Oops. I'll pause there. Um, I'm looking, I can see Alexis, you look like you might have a burning question. No, it's actually not a question. But yeah, maybe I can comment if you want some expertise on HR, I can comment. But I think your approach is pretty valid. And let's say it more applies to like senior roles, not junior ones. But let's say when you pick the pick colleagues at the early stage of the company. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and also we have Ivan raised his hands. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd like yes. to ask a question. It actually relates to what was just said by Alexis. So I wanted to ask, do you have any recommendations for super early stage when this uh, is pre-seed, like first people in the team, first like five, 10 people, or even the second person at all? And does the situation change somehow, or we should basically follow the same process? How would you comment on that? Uh, for the first 10 highs, which I think set the standard and the culture for your organization, I would do this, but times three. I would basically, I would dibble down on the interviewing. I would spend as much time as possible with them. I would go super, super deep on referencing. I would also look at the equity that you're willing to um, split with those early hires to make sure that they are motivated, sorry, motivated, aligned. They're not penalized. Um, I do think this applies at earlier stage. So again, we, we work with companies that are, I would say, anywhere from 10 uh, people upwards. Um, and we found applying a, a methodical approach has been um, very beneficial. Now, that said, there are many different ways of kind of skinning a cat, if you will. But this works well early, but this definitely works well at once you've got series A and you can apply this, this lens to it, this works really well. But uh, if it's like super early stage when you're even not sure if you will do this business or not, if this oh. will, like you um, still testing the idea, testing the business model, and you just need someone to get this uh, design of this website done yep. better quicker than uh, uh, than in great quality. Uh, so uh, how to approach this dilemma of quality versus speed? Uh, MVP thinking versus uh, hiring someone for better quality, uh, hiring just a friend or somebody whom you happen to meet in some random place versus going through the rigorous uh, rigorous process. Uh, how would you uh, oh, comment fine. on this trade-off? Yeah, so it's, it's a good trade-off. So you have the three sides, which is speed, cost, and then time to deliver. Um, with the very early stage ones, I think that's where you, I would be tapping into your, your network, be it school friends, university friends, uh, clubs that you're in. Um, again, I, I would use some parts of this. I think the more time you can spend with them to understand, it depends if you want to hire them for the long term or you want to hire them to achieve a certain milestone, probably a better way of looking at it. So if it's somebody where you just want them to build a website or help you launch a you know, minimal viable product or do something, I would not be as thorough on this. I think that that will come out in terms of the quality of the product, the ability to hit those deadlines. Um, this really is kind of when you've got um, probably seed and onwards is where I would be looking at this. And then series A, I would use this as kind of being like the, the framework. But at the very, very early stages, it is finding that person who will join you on that particular project as opposed to a company. Um, and then being very clear in terms of the KPIs, what the success look like, but you will be spending a lot of time with them. So you want to make sure that you gel in terms of 
uh, communication style, delivery of um, projects, but it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Keep going. Okay. All right. This probably will blow your mind because it's the opposite of what we just spoke about. <laughs> so, um, but I'll just give you some context to this, which is, I'll just put the throws up here. So we went from hiring one engineer a, a week to hiring 50 engineers a, a week at Skype. Um, we put this process in place. Now, based on where you are in the journey of your companies, this is going to look pretty like hardcore. Um, but the way we looked at it was really using the recruiters to pre-screen making sure that you had uh, affordable, motivated candidates in the pipeline. We would use an engineer to do a, uh, a probe in terms of, do they kind of meet the bar technically before they go on? We would have very structured uh, three times one hour um, interviews. We'd have predetermined interview questions based on the role. Uh, we'd have our eng leadership on sites. We'd have our hiring committees. We'd have an offer process. We'd have a closing process and an onboarding process. I have to stress, this is when we were doing like 50 hires a week. So it's, it's very, very different. But the point being is we were able to take a candidate from uh, a candidate on a Monday to closing an offer the same Friday because we had this, this batch day approach in here. So again, it's different. I appreciate the, the volume and the scale is a little bit different. But the, 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 pro, the, the point here being is we could do this incredibly quickly because it was basically an operating rhythm for us. And then we asked 152 founders of 54 of Europe's most successful companies what they wish they spent more time on when they were building their companies. And by a factor of five, so five times more than anything else, it was hiring. So it was basically, if they could start again, what would they do? And talent and recruitment, again, by far the, the, the biggest thing they would go back and spend more time on. I think it's very, Sometimes, uh, I think to your point uh, earlier, which is sometimes you just need somebody to get something done. And I get that. Um, but at a certain point in your company's life, it will be about how do I build something that will you know, last decades or generational? Um, if I think back to Google's first mission or mission was to uh, organize the world's information, make it universally accessible to be a company that lasts for over 300 years. So it's kind of like from the very beginning, they were looking to build something which was multi-generational. Again, Google's changed quite a bit now. Um, but even here at Atomico, we're looking for a company that will last over 100 years. So we're very thoughtful in terms of how we recruit, how we onboard, how we lead, how we manage. It's, it's a big focus for us. And onboarding, again, I've spoken about this. So it really is kind of, it's not about the swag and the dinner and the ping pong. It really is about kind of getting to maximum productivity as fast as possible. Um, again, at scale, so it's a little bit different where you are, um, which is why I was asking the stage of the companies uh, to make sure this was uh, tailored appropriately, which is uh, then they're, they're met by you. You're the, the founder, you're the hiring manager, you meet them, you greet them. You have a buddy on board who can help them navigate uh, how things get done in your companies. The buddy should be a high performer. The manager should, if you're hiring new leaders into your companies or managers, they should manage, they should uh, shadow tenured managers. So you understand how to manage in your organization. Otherwise, they're going to bring the way they manage from other companies to your company. Some have good practices, um, others not so good. Pre-joining letter I mentioned before. Uh, and then we do a, a pretty interesting boot camp around day one expectations. So what do I expect from you? Going back to the letter that you had before, the HR setup, the laptops, everything is, is kind of ready for when they turn up. Uh, day five check-in. So on the Friday, we would sit down with folks and say, who did you meet this week? What did you learn? Uh, what other questions do you have that we can help you clarify? Um, same thing there. And then if we can see that there, I'm going to have to minimize this. Let me just leave it over here. Uh, day 30, formal check-in. So we want to make sure that they are meeting expectations. They've got their OKRs. They've got their business plan. Um, and they're off to a good start. I'll pause there. Any questions on onboarding? All good, okay. And then leadership and management, I think one, again, back to a key driver. So uh, there's some really good examples here. Laszlo Bock, who's my former boss, uh, my boss's boss, I should say. Um, what we wanted to do at Google was, we had this um, hypothesis that we didn't need managers. This is long before I joined. Um, so Larry disbanded all managers in the organization and he went to chaos pretty quickly. So we found that uh, the best performing teams have best performing managers. And we wanted to make sure that all Googlers had a high performing manager and we put a, a training program in place. Oh, hang on, that's not good. 
Give me a second. Back up here, sorry. So why is it important? It's all about building employee engagement. Here we go. And employee engagement represents uh, the enthusiasm and the connection that employees have to the company. And also it's an outcome of the actions of those companies, which is driven predominantly by leaders and managers. And then going back to data, it's the second reason that people either stay or leave your organization is the quality of leaders and managers in your organization. So we think it's a, bit, a big area to focus on. Now, a lot of companies we work with think, I don't need leaders and managers at this stage. This is a bit clunky. Um, but we find that the, the, the training of leaders, the training of managers will have a material impact on the success of your company and the ability to recruit and the ability to retain. And then again, we look at the data, let me just down here a little bit, is uh, these are the manager behavioral traits of certain companies. So when we were looking to build our own manager uh, training for Atomico, the way we think of our company is we're a blend of uh, technology folks, so operators, a blend of founders, people who have built companies, and then a blend of uh, consulting, so McKinsey, Bain, Booz, and then a blend of investment banking. So we have folks here from Goldman Sachs, um, JP Morgan, uh, private equity. So we looked at what uh, best in class were doing in terms of their behaviors, and then we came up with our own. We found that the traits were really, really good managers were great at recruiting, had very uh, frequent structured one-to-ones. They were consistent, especially under stress. They were very good at communicating and they would help with career development. And last but not least, they were great coaches. So they were very skilled at delivering feedback. And then they would celebrate success. So not necessarily theirs, but the, the team's success. And what's this one down here? And they would remove underperformers very quickly. So we took from, the, uh, from those companies, and then we created our own framework, which is around creating a, an environment of psychological safety. For us, it's important that people can feel they can speak up about any topic. And we've had that happen a number of times. It doesn't matter if you're junior, senior, investing role, non-investment role, but the ability to voice concerns and speak up is, is something we really value. Um, managers here help interpret the Atomico wider mission, our vision and our principles. So clarifying, explaining, reminding. <coughs> Excuse me. They're great coaches and they help with career development. So we have, like most people, we have very ambitious people that want to either get promoted, do well, change jobs. So how can we help them with actionable feedback so they can achieve their own personal goals? Um, that they set ambitious uh, goals without micromanaging. So we want to kind of point the way, but not necessarily be involved in everything day to day. Hold regular and effective one-to-ones. So this is a really powerful tool in terms of clarifying Where's the company going? How am I performing? Hey, can you help me achieve my goals? Remove roadblocks, super powerful tool. And then what we want to do is communicate with the managers that we were gonna go from like 20 people to a hundred odd. Um, so we're telling them that the, as managers, this is what we can ex we would like to expect from them over the next six months. Then we helped them with training before we started informing the rest of the organization. So we looked at these five uh, competency areas. We developed workshops and boot camps. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and we wanted to measure what matters. So uh, one of our portfolio companies, PECOM, which was acquired by Workday, uh, we would use a tool to measure employee net promoter score. And then we would hold managers accountable for leading their teams well. So you get an EMPS score or a PECOM score. If it drops below a certain number, then um, you know, we'll, we'll do our very best to help leaders or managers become better. Um, but in some instances, they are not the right people to be in a leadership or a management role. And they're better off being in an IC role. And this is what we put together. So we put a bunch of uh, modules together, one-to-ones, giving feedback, communication skills. We do a lot around OKRs, performance management 101, career development conversations. How do you create psychological safety? It's all very well just to say, but how do you actually do that? Um, being an excellent recruiter, developing people, and then the onboarding piece. I'll pause there. Any questions? I'm scanning down. Nope. Okay. Yes, there is a hand raised. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I can't, I can't see the hand raised, sorry. Uh, yes, hello, I have a question regarding the safety. So it seems that uh, a lot of managers say that uh, you are safe to tell anything that you really want. But uh, in fact, uh, it happens not so often. So it is interesting to find out like the practical tips of building such uh, environment. Yeah, no problem. So that, again, it's like leading by example. So if somebody comes to you with either a challenge or a problem 
Um, one is acknowledging that challenge, that problem. So I hear what you're saying. Let me see how I can help you. Um, it's identifying the root cause of what's creating that problem. Sometimes it's uh, expectations are misaligned. Sometimes it's a behavioral thing. Sometimes it's a, a skill thing. So what's actually driving that? Um, then the key thing is to show change based on what you find. So if it is a, a person who is misbehaving or not behaving appropriately, um, ad addressing that, identifying that, sitting down with the person and saying, this is not, this is not acceptable. We'll put you on a, a correction course, but if it continues, you're going to be leaving this company. So I think it's kind of just showing action based on people um, showing that they, they have a problem with something. Okay. I mean, you know, there's, there's more other things you can do in terms of like a, a HR hotline or, you know, we have email straight to our CEO, something goes, it depends on, on what's happening actually. So there are certain non-negotiables. So if there's something where someone feels really uncomfortable for whatever reason, um, then they can go straight to Nicholas through, you know, just contact Nicholas basically. We have our PCOM tool where we can look for themes emerging in the feedback. Um, we do skip levels a lot to kind of dig into certain topics. Um, but the, the key thing is to uh, show an action based on a reaction. Okay. I think Ivan, have you got a question? Yes, I'd like to ask, uh, how do you help uh, founders of early stage uh, startups to become better managers? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So what we do is uh, we have what we call uh, People 101 boot camps. So uh, new, well, yeah, new portfolio leaders or functional, or start, uh, sorry, new portfolio for founders, we have created um, people workshops. So they can come here for two days. And it's with other cohorts of founders. And then we'll take them through a series of workshop and modules and role play and, and content. Um, we will bring back founders from maybe one or two years before. And they'll share their learnings um, in terms of what they've, the challenges they faced. So we do a lot of, lot of uh, workshops, but also peer, peer mentoring. Um, but having, you can talk to me and I'll tell you, you know, theoretically, or I've seen this and this happened. Or you can talk to a founder who has just either had to reduce their headcount by 80%. They've had to fire a co-founder. They've had to do this, that, and the other. So those real-life practical examples, we think are much more powerful. But the, to answer your question, we have online, we have offline, we have mentoring, we have peer sessions, we do our founders retreat. Um, but we think that's where we can really amplify the, the lessons learned. Is that your question? There is also one more hand raised yeah. from oh. Alec. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, then one more question regarding the community in Atomico. Do you have a special like chat community for HR managers uh, from portfolio companies and something like that? I'm so sorry, I missed I missed that question. Yeah, uh, regarding your community in Atomico, yep. Yep. Uh, is there a special chat for HR managers telling people from your portfolio companies how is, <laughs> like this uh, conversation between uh, founders and HR is going in terms of community? Yeah, so we have a community manager. So Erica joined us a while back. Um, and then we have different ways of building community. So we have Slack channels. We have um, subgroups. We do founder to founder. We do uh, marketing to marketing, end to end, product to product. Uh, and then within our own HR group, we have, I think we have 75 people leaders where there's this two parts of the Slack channel. There's Slack channels that we sit in as Atomicans to help enable the conversation. And there's Slack channels that we are not part of. So it's much, uh, sometimes I think the portfolio functional leaders feel safer asking to their peers than asking to their, you know, I hate to say to their VCs, but it, for some reason, if we're in the room, it's a different conversation than when we're, when we're not in the room. Um, mm -hmm. And then in our founder retreat, so we did one in Stockholm this summer. I think we got about 70 something founders together. Uh, we were not in any of the sessions. So we set the sessions up where it is purely the portfolio functional portfolio founders. We bring in um, guest speakers, we bring in uh, breakout founders, um, but they were in there sharing their kind of um, problems and concerns. Um, but we are not part of those conversations. We enable the conversations to happen. It is okay, it's easy. <laughs> Sorry. And also there is a question in the chat. Um... I can read it, or oh, no, if you want, you can read it. it. Yep, sorry. Yep. My, okay. Uh, okay, cool. Okay. Shall, shall HR focus be different at each team? For, yeah, okay. Um, who's this from? Is this from 
Uh, okay, um, let me show you that again. Quaker's different. Same form, stage form. Storming Norman <laughs> before me. Um, yeah, I think it is. I think it's at the early stage, it really is about kind of recruiting is the powerhouse. Um, the ability to go and get star engineers or functional leaders or whatever that looks like in terms of uh, being very, very strong at recruiting. Um, the storming, um, interesting way of putting it, which I think then you still, it's more expansion. So I think recruiting is also very, very powerful. Performing, I see, so I think of it more as you have performance management, but I think it's performance development. So how can we help um, employees or, or founders or functional leaders become better? That's a very different skill set. So I think of it as like we do sales and marketing, which is recruiting and people ops. So again, recruiting is obvious. It's going and finding these people. The people ops is about how can you develop them? So how can you build uh, ELTV? And I would think of it, we, we used to use this phrase, which was find, grow, and keep. So at Google HR, we had those three areas, which is we had people who would find people. We had uh, uh, people, HR people who would look at growing. So how do we develop you? And then we'd have teams, what we called employee experience. How can we keep you in the role? And that was more around compensation, work environment, um, a slightly different skill set. But that, by that time, we were massive. But I would think of it sales and marketing, recruiting, and, and HR. Does that answer your question? Cool, thank you. All right, just bung that over here. Trying to get the, how do I minimize this one? Cool. Um, I won't go, I've covered these in the, in the early, in the different conversations, but frameworks, we spoke about hiring, onboarding, leadership, we're big fans of OKRs. I think sometimes I heard a thing, uh, someone said that uh, Google invented OKRs to slow down the competition, which is an interesting way of looking at it. I think OKRs, when they're deployed uh, effect efficiently, can be a very powerful tool. Um, but we're big fans of creating alignment for uh, the founders, the boards. We use OKRs to create board alignment. We call it the five levers workshop. Um, but I think sometimes, especially at Series A, when you have new investors joining the cap table with different opinions, we use alignment to make sure that the whole board is aligned around the where the company's going, the challenges ahead, what KPIs look like. I think for us, it's very powerful. Performance development versus performance management. So how can you help people? You know, you're not you're not going to have training departments. You're not going to have anything like that. But what are the projects internally that people can develop their skill set on uh, for free, basically? But thinking about that development piece, uh, it's super important. Compensation philosophy. So uh, for me, this is really important. Um, when I joined Cisco years and years ago, uh, I was given a, a small amount of stock and then we got to be a $700 billion company and that worked out pretty well. Um, so being as generous as you can with stock as, as widely across your organization. So how do you think about compensation? I think is really important. Um, it will drive long-term incentives. How do you think about um, bonus plans for either sales folks when you get a bit bigger? But I would be very thoughtful around the equity that you grant to new people, especially when you're early. Um, and not give it away too cheaply. I've, I've seen some startups give away equity for services. Um, that can be a very expensive service if you hit a certain certain valuation. Um, <laughs> sorry. And then somebody needs to drive these. So that's where we go back to, um, go back over, sorry, is a recruiter as early as possible. You can get part-time people leaders. You don't need somebody five days a week focused on employee relations issues. It's sort of certain things that you need a bit of help with. Um, but bringing in the right people or using your VCs or whoever is providing you with capital um, to help you build those skills until you need that person long term. The way we think about it is we will work with founders for probably the first six months. And then if you need somebody who looks like us more than two days a week or three days a week, we will help you go and find that person and we'll help you onboard that person as well. And I'd say that's it. Um, culture, hiring, onboarding, leaders. Uh, and then the best recruiters and the best TA folks you can get. I'll pause there. <laughs> I have to apologize for the cough. Uh, yeah, so hopefully um, questions, feedback, thoughts. Okay, so feel free to raise your hands or just drop the message to the chat if you have unstable internet. And yeah, Dan is here to answer. I have a question, uh, Dan. Thank you very much. So uh, I have a question for, from your experience. Uh, uh, 
how long it will take to see if there is matching between uh, on actually at least uh, cultural and uh, uh, principles level between actually new employee and uh, your culture, your actually uh, at least your own as a founder or a CEO of company. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have a saying here, which is when where there's doubt, there's no doubt. Um, so you could say, but I think by the end of week one, you will have figured out is this person a good hire culturally or not. Normally, you know, if you if you're not super excited by the person before they join you on day one, you shouldn't hire them. You know, that goes back to am I hiring someone for a project or am I hiring someone to help me build a company? Um, and I've had it here where uh, not here other com other other companies where. You're excited, the person turns up, but straight away you're getting warning signals. You know, your, your spider sense is tingling, which is, oh, this something's not quite right here. What is it? Normally it comes down to expectations around the role. So you may have overhired. You may have hired someone who is too senior to do the work that you need to get done. That's why that calibration piece is really important. Um, and then you'll get feedback very quickly from the people they're interacting with. Everything from folks on reception, folks they're we're coding with folks they're selling with um and that's why i like to that that day five check-in but also vice versa which is oh vladimir you met with ivan how did he go mm -hmm. great guy he's awesome um or vladimir you met with dan yeah it was okay and it's kind of when they kind of go yeah it was okay you know it's not okay but i, I would say if you're not really excited before making that offer don't make the offer um but spend the first week really digging deep into the team which is is he doing what he said he would do? Is she doing what she said she would do? Are they adding value? Um, and that's why you have these kind of five-day check-in, 30-day check-in. And then across a bunch of companies, the there's one company, which I won't tell you which company it is, but it's a really inter interesting process where the team vote if the person passes probation, not the manager, which is a really cool way of doing it, actually. I think it's a really cool way. So the manager is separate to the conversation. It's all confidential, but the team will give thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, it's a, I think it's, it's a nice way of doing it from the people that sit next to the person that see the work every single day. Yeah. But, uh, the, the question was, thank you for the, uh, one week, uh, like concrete and I understand oh. the context, but as usual, for example, uh, if we have an onboarding process that it's the uh, last from one week till one month, it depended on the quantity. So you can't judge uh, based on only like on board or it's also counted uh in your case yeah I, I would say by the end of, by the end of the first week you know and okay. that's based on the company the interactions with the company and then um how they approach certain conversations you know the, we, we hired a guy in here uh he ran a hundred million arr company uh, sorry 100 million arr sales function he had over 300 sales reps working for him um he's building training modules he's building video he's building guides you kind of know he's got he's going to do very well Previously, we've hired somebody who wasn't as proactive as that. I think you, I think you can tell by the end of week. Okay, thank you. Got it. Um, yeah. May I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Um, so overall, I'd like to ask about the hiring uh, process. Um, so even for um, later stage, it sounds like the, the process which you suggest is very uh strong very a lot of uh, things like barazing and uh, uh like my question is not about the process but about the mindset so sometimes a startup is something not cool yet so uh sometimes even founders are not sure if it's a really cool project or not um however this in order to go through this such as such a difficult process uh, you need to be confident that uh, you are next Google or next something. But uh, how how to think about this if you are not sure yet? You know, the, so so that you do not become a bullshitter who just uh, seems uh, overconfident. And uh, uh, you know, I hope you got my uh, question. If I repeat it back, just so I'm, I'm clear, is this about how do you as founders go about firing people if you are not going to complete the project? No, it's about um, the mindset for hiring. Like, if I'm not start up with school brand, yeah. um, it's hard for me to push people for ten rounds of interview for bar raising, then committee yeah. interview, etc. Yeah. How to think about this 
if you're yeah. not Google yet. Not, not yet. I think it's a bit like raising capital, um, which is identifying people you want to join on your journey. It's about getting to know them before you need them. I think that's really important. Um, it's about spending time with them to explain what is it you're trying to solve, um, the type of company you want to build. And then at, you know, at the early stages, you don't need hiring committees. You don't need things like that. It really is, you know, think it could be anything of working a project together. Um, but but I would spend more time up front in the beginning to build a pool of people you can always recruit from. So if, you know, you don't. It's like there's a lot of lots of things. Right? It's like um, Google was printing money. I mean, that's the thing. There are, there are you look at these like Facebook and other companies. They had found perfect product market fit and go to market fit. You know, you had, we had unlimited capital. So it's, it's not kind of, it, it's more about the companies where you have to create a sense of excitement about what you're working on, the type of company you're gonna build. Depending on the person's background, some people are excited by the, um, the economics that they can make for themselves. And other people are excited by the team I'm gonna work with, the technical problems. So it's just adjusting the pitch based on who you're talking to, but building your network along the way um, and getting to know that person and spending time. So, you know, the things like a, the bar raiser, that could be a, a, a conversation over a coffee or a lunch or a dinner in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you develop yourself as a person, as a candidate? Tell me about some stuff. How do you self-improve? So it's kind of just having those one or two questions that will help kind of kickstart the conversation. Uh, and then the other thing, I think, I think the question was very kind of, how do you, how do you stop yourself from hiring bullshitters? That to me is the reference check. You know, I worked on this product. Oh, cool. Who did you work with? Oh, I worked with um, Vladimir. I keep seeing Vladimir's picture in his headphones. That's why I keep picking on him. Um, I worked with Vladimir. Oh, cool. Can I speak to Vladimir? Oh, wait, uh, um, I'm not sure. So it's just writing down the things that you heard through the meetings or the interviews and then spending that five or 10 minutes kind of going, calling up, hey, Vladimir, I got this guy. He said he worked, you're building this product. Um, how was your experience working with him or her? Pretty soon he's going to go. Well, he didn't do that. I did that. Or actually, he was. You know, he completed the project, but what he left behind was devastation in the team. There's lots of ways of doing that, um, but I would always go back to reference checking. Cool. Well, thank you. And also, there is a uh, Alexis. Yeah, okay, yeah. with his like... pain rest. Yeah. Hi, Alexis. Yeah, I would like to comment. You know, uh, typically you could, let's say, predict one soft skills fit for a particular role by like 30 minutes standard test. You could design specific tests, for example, fit for technical roles or fit for management roles, etc. And like, you know, a typical kind of case questions. And it's possible to predict a person's fit for, let's say, cultural fit and soft skills fit with a 30 minute test, essentially. That's possible, you know, I've been doing that. So I think that's possible and you don't need like, maybe of course you need to do like one week a posteriori analysis of person's performance, but let's say uh, to make a hiring decision, you need like maybe up to two, three hours of like tests, interviews combined in total. Really? It's not so, let's say time and resource consuming. Once you properly define the rule, and once you properly set methodologies and let's say case questions, you compare them on, yeah. And, and have them present that case study back to you. I think that's where you can kind of go deep into what are the resources, how you're gonna do it, um, the KPIs. I think the, the way, and also the way they handle when you push back on their proposal. So do they get very defensive um, or do they kind of go, oh, that's interesting. That's a new data to me, therefore I'll change my perspective. It's whatever works for your company, but there's a script in terms of, the things that uh, you, the things that you need in your company will be different from other people, but to your point, that's exactly what I would do. Do you want a job, Alexis? Want to come and work here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's perfectly possible. Let's say two, three hours max. Let's say just define it properly and spend uh, some time to prepare. And then uh, just uh, build sufficient pipeline because if you are comparing like two people, then of course, you wouldn't be able to, let's say, judge uh, what's the best because, uh, yeah, you're maybe you're comparing like three, four star people, not five star. Yeah. So build sufficient pipeline and let's say uh, 
uh, do scorecards like uh, Dan mentioned. Yeah, very important. You know, we have designed, for example, a grading model for technical people, 35 parameters, let's say, and then uh, we achieved like 95% accuracy of predicting a successful developer who, who will retain with a client on the project. How big is your company, Alexis? Proxify. It was at Proxify.io. I'm sorry, it's data please? driven, it's possible, but yeah, scorecards, let's say uh, various data sources, not just one, not just interview, not just a coding task, not just a soft skills quiz, but everything combined, you know, and then judging uh, and CV as well. Yeah, this is one of the elements as well. So confirmed commercial experience, etc. So just try to have multiple sources of data like parameterization, like numeric parameterization, and then you'll be able to judge quickly who performs the function and who does not and who fits culturally as well. And the more people you interview, the, the, the faster you'll get at doing this. It becomes a muscle. It's like going to the gym, which I need to do more and more. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, yeah. Can I ask one more question if we have oh, time? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, because, uh, sorry, for kids on the background, yeah. So as I understand, it's obvious, I think, when a startup is growing, uh, uh, you are hiring uh, with rising bar, bar uh, principles, you are hiring more experienced and more sound uh, people. What to do with uh, previous uh, employees that have just support you in a, the hardest, let's say, times in startup, but right now they're really not fitted uh, the organization you are building as growing organization you are building so what is the uh, actually yeah you you, you fired uh, advice fire fire. so i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking <laughs> so, right so there's oh, but there's two there's two camps i think there's two camps which is um there are those that can the, the way i think about it is can they stay six months ahead of your business so they do they have a growth mindset can they develop their skills yes or no if it's a yes, then I would invest in helping them grow those skills because they've been, you know, they were with you in the beginning. Um, and I think that's just the right thing to do. There's a second question I would go to, which is making sure their compensation is also in sync with new people you bring in. Sometimes people forget to do that. And there are the folks who are just not going to make it. You know, it's a bit like there's a sports analogy, which is they get you to here, but they won't take you to the next wave. I think just being as gracious with them as possible um, if I, again, depending on the size of the company, so I appreciate you, you, you know, your folks are, are in a very early stage, allowing them to keep the vested equity, I think is very fair. Um, and then treating them with respect on the way out, which is, um, you know, our time here together has been a lot of fun. You've been really super important. You've helped me build something pretty amazing, but you're not going to be right for the, the next phase of our company's growth. But I want you to walk away with dignity. You want to be treated the way you want to be treated. It's really important. Let them keep the equity that they vested, if that's possible. Um, and then just being really clear and transparent as to the reasons why you don't want to walk and go, not knowing why you had to let them go. Um, but being as generous as possible based on the, the, the company circumstances. But that, that to me would be the, the, the primary, which is just being very clear and uh, transparent as to the reasons why and generous as, as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Sales. Got it. Thank you. I think that's it so yeah if someone else wants to speak up please do it raise your hand and let's wait for a minute and see if there is any okay it looks like there is no Thank you so much, Dan. Actually, it was the last session of uh, Coaches for Ukraine, and uh, at least for this volume. And thank you so much. It was an honor for us to host you. And thanks for sharing your knowledge. And to everyone, I will send the recording to our Slack group tomorrow or on Friday. And wait a second, let me send you the survey. So actually, the last session in the volume, because we are relaunching the project, and we will be back next year in 2023. But uh, please help us tailor it better for you. 
And yep, I'm dropping the survey link. It's, it takes like a minute. Just give your honest answers. What you like, what didn't you like? Uh, and yeah. Perfect. And thank and you all for coming. From my side, um, thanks for inviting me. Um, hope you and your family stay safe. And uh, what else can I say? Uh, yeah, thanks for the invite, and hope you all stay all stay safe. Yep. I'm actually trying to send you the link, but it, it doesn't work for some reason. Wait a second. Zemi, can you help me please? And just drop the link. <laughs> okay, anyway, the link is in our Slack group. It doesn't work for some reason. Yep, and um, thanks for, Thanks for coming and yeah. All right, take care, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Nice Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.